Hi, and welcome back to Faith Foster Fire Life. Today, let's talk about what the first 24 hours with your foster child might look like. If you're just coming across our channel, Faith Foster Fire Life, I wanna welcome you. My name is Val. My husband, Pat, and I had been foster parents for the last 12 years. And on this channel, we try to advocate for all children in foster care and inspire and educate potential foster parents in their journey to caring for these children. Today, we wanted to touch upon a question we get of lots of curiosity. What's it like the first 24 hours when a child comes into your care? We're gonna look at this first 24 hours from the perspective of a traditional foster parent. So this is different than a kinship placement. So a kinship placement is when a child is placed with you and you are a family member or a close friend of a family and you're already familiar with that child. So that looks very different than a traditional foster care placement where a child is removed from a home where you don't know anything about the child, you don't know anything about the family, and they oftentimes are removed in an emergency situation. So CPS was called to investigate a child abuse situation and they've gone and decided that that child needs to be removed immediately. And you as the foster family get a phone call and they are looking for a home within a matter of hours. That's typically what happens. So we're gonna look at the first 24 hours based on that type of scenario that my husband and I have primarily been faced with over the last 12 years. So you say yes, you know this child's about to be brought to your home or children if you're doing sibling groups, and what is that even going to look like? Well, most likely the child will arrive with very, very little. When I say little, I mean like the clothes on their back, and that even goes for babies. A lot of times they just come with no diapers, no wipes, no formula, um, not a change of clothes, nothing. There are rare instances where a parent will put together a bag to go with their children, but not very often. So in some of our other videos, we talked about how to prepare for your first foster child and to have those types of things on hand because the likelihood that you're gonna get them when they get dropped off is slim. So. When that social worker shows up at your house, I'm gonna tell you a lot of times it's like the middle of the night or you know, 11 o'clock at night or something like that. What typically happens when a child is removed is first they are brought to the hospital to get a medical clearance. And this is to ensure that the child is not enduring any kind of medical crisis that they need immediate um, care for. So once that child is cleared medically, then they can be brought to your home. And that takes a couple of hours from the time CPS makes the decision the child needs to be removed to the time that they make it to your home. So you usually just have a couple of hours to prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, and all the other things. When they arrive at your home, the child should be in at least um, somewhat good health. Now, a lot of times kids come with things like lice or um, diaper rashes or common colds or some other illness, but it's things that you as a parent should be able to care for them at home. So it's a very sad situation. Um, many times we've had children come in with literally just diapers on. Um, a lot of times we've had, we've had kids who've come in with clothes that are like too small on them and they're busting out of their clothes um, but that's not always the case we've also had children who have had um, all the worldly possessions that they've ever needed but they were neglected in other ways when that worker comes right in don't expect them to stay there for a long time and give you giving you lots of information about the child or the family the bare minimum of what they know is just what the child has um, been removed for so they may tell you it was um, something involving drugs or alcohol or some kind of abuse um, that's about all that they can tell you at drop-off. Unless a family has been known to the department in the past for some, they might have additional history, but usually it's very, very limited. So you have to be prepared to care for a child knowing pretty much nothing about them. And that includes things like allergies. They may not have that information. So you have to be very, very careful with everything you do with that child until you gather that information. You won't know what kind of foods they like, what 
what they are used to eating. We've gotten calls with um, emplacements for toddlers who we didn't know, are they still on a uh, bottle? Are they at a, drinking out of a sippy cup? Um, are they on formula? Do they drink milk? Do they have a milk allergy? These are all the unknowns. And so be prepared that when your child arrives to you, the social worker will probably not know the answers to these questions. So you have to parent from zero and just do the best you can with the limited information that you've been given. And I just wanna put a big, strong um, piece of advice out there for potential foster parents who have never parented before. Do your best due diligence to gain some childcare experience. If you have friends, family that have children and you can babysit for them, spend time with them, ask them lots of questions, then please go ahead and do that because you cannot rely on your social worker to give you a parenting handbook. And none of us have a parenting handbook when our children are born, even those of us who have biological children. But there's a big difference between a child that is born and you're um, taking them home and you're establishing all of their new routines versus a child who has been used to certain things in their family of origin coming to you and you having to figure it all out. So if you have gained some kind of childcare experience before and you get your first placement, that will really help you just give you some confidence and some experience with what children are like, what babies are like, what toddlers are like, what um, school age kids are like, or even teenagers. <laughs> Might be a little harder to get to know a teenager, um, practice with teenagers before, but um, so that's just a big piece of advice I give parents, uh, potential foster parents who are not parents yet themselves. And then for those of you who have parented, another piece of advice is you have that experience, but don't make the assumption that the children coming into your care are going to be similar to your biological children. Again, keep in mind, they are coming from a completely different family of origin. They may have a completely different culture. Um, they may live in a completely different kind of environment. Uh, it might be uh, rural versus urban. Um, there's just so many factors, so you have to have an open mind, an open heart, a willingness to go with the flow. Now, let's get back to some of the basics. When your social worker shows up or the CPS investigator shows up, they will obviously bring the child in, introduce your, you to each other, and the first thing you want to do is make sure that they're really, really comfortable. That means welcoming them into your home, um, finding something that you know someone of their age group would enjoy. So if it's a toddler, maybe offering them um, a sippy cup of water or a bottle or um, a stuffed animal and some, something like that. Now, you might think that you're a perfect stranger. There's no way this child's gonna come and sit with you and be comfortable with you. But I will tell you, there are many kids that come into foster care that are going to behave in a way that you're not going to expect. They may very willingly climb into your lap. And that's not a good thing. Um, on the outset, it may seem like, wow, this child is so friendly and maybe the situation they were in wasn't that traumatic and they're doing okay. I will caution you, and we won't get into it in this video, but there's a very real um, thing called uh, reactive attachment disorder and that's when a child basically is not bonded to their biological parents or their primary caregiver and they in essence will attach to anybody in a, in a very shallow sense so if they see you as a warm welcoming adult they'll easily go with you which can be a very big problem in the future with strangers we've dealt with that many times with our foster children and it's a very heartbreaking thing and like i said we're not going to get into that in this video but you may be surprised that your foster child might easily just walk into your home plop themselves on your couch and kind of feel comfortable. Um, it may be that they're used to couch surfing and just going into different people's homes all the time. You just don't know the situation they're coming from. And then you might also get the situation where the child is completely terrified of strangers and um, you know they've already been with social workers, CPS workers, they've been at the hospital, and now here's another new stranger. 
So in those instances, actually in both kinds of instances, reassure your foster child that you're there to care for them, um, you've been expecting them and you've made your home ready for them and um, you're so happy that they're there because you want to make them feel safe, okay? and. You know, when you meet the child, you'll find a natural way to speak to them and kind of figure out where they're coming from and if they're timid or if they're outgoing and all of those kinds of things. And um, I did want to touch on another little topic that we might get into in another video, and it's called the honeymoon period. And so you may have a child who comes in in that first day. They're almost excited to be with you. Um, they are... Uh, in a new place and this is like a new adventure. Maybe they don't really understand the ramifications of what just happened in their family of origin. And we call that a honeymoon period where you're like, wow, this isn't so bad. These, you know, this child doesn't have a lot of behavior issues. And um, usually that lasts for just a little while and then once they're comfortable with you, their real behaviors come out, their real fears come out and all of that. And then sometimes the opposite happens where, especially with children who have been in and out of foster care, they do not have a honeymoon period at the beginning and they are like gonna lay it all out there for you. They are going to be as badly behaved as they can be. They wanna test you. Um, they're fighting the whole process. And you know, in their little minds, um, they don't understand that it doesn't really matter how good or bad they are. They're in the situation because of decisions their parents made, not because of anything they did. And so sometimes kids act out according to what they think will get them back into their family of origin, or they wanna test you as their second or third or fourth foster parent if you're really gonna put up with their shenanigans. So you could have one of the other. You could have a honeymoon period right at the beginning, or you could see some really bad behaviors right off the bat, and I mean within those 24 hours. And um, then sometimes they have a honeymoon period a few months down the road. It, it all depends. So those first 24 hours, you really can't predict how a child is going to react to you and respond to your new home. That's why I say you have to keep an open mind. There is no hard and fast rules about what children do in those situations. Your job is just to do your very best to make them feel safe and comfortable and loved and um, go with their pace. So even little ones, you may think, oh, you know, you're gonna tuck them in that night and they need to be, um, you know, read a book and sung a song and cuddled and all these things that you maybe do with your own biological children and they may not want that at all. They may be like, you are a stranger, just give me my teddy bear and turn off the light and let, let, let that be it. Um, and then other times they need that comfort. So you really have to pay close attention to those kinds of cues to go at their pace with how comfortable they are with you. So after the social worker has come in and introduced you to the child and you've kind of gotten them settled in as best you can so that you can talk to the social worker a little bit, they're gonna share, the social worker will share um, whatever information they have with you. And it is okay as a foster parent to ask questions, don't, feel like you have to be silent and just say, okay, 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 and go with what they tell you, you can press a little bit. They'll only share with you what they're legally allowed to share, but the more information you get as soon as you can is the is better because then you have some background uh, information as to why your foster child might be acting the way that they are. And so ask those questions, get the information that you can get. And sometimes, you know, social workers are human too. They may forget to tell you things because it's a very stressful, um, high emotional situation that they just were in with a, a birth family, removing their child. And now they're coming to you and doing this other transition. And so they have a lot of moving parts going on. So if you, um, could even, when you get that phone call, take a, a notebook and start writing down all the questions that you have. So when the um, child's dropped off and you have a minute to talk to the social worker, you can kind of go through that list and say, hey, do you know, do they have allergies? Do they have siblings? Um, is there, this their first placement? Um, do you know any immediate danger that they might be in? Um, have they expressed any fears 
as you were with them for the last couple of hours. Um, just anything you can think of that's going to help you as their foster parent because between that first drop off and that first day, if, especially if you're not working with a private agency, you may not get to talk to your social worker or anybody in the system for days going forward. Um, really good social workers, or if you work with a private agency that has more staff available, you will be able to talk to people sooner. But even if you get to talk to them sooner, you may they may not have any new information for you. So the most you can get that first night is the best. So you're going to gain as much information as you can and sign whatever paperwork that they have for you. And I do know that the amount of paperwork that comes through that first day is different based on where you live. In Rhode Island, where we live, um, we do all of our home study, all of our signing ahead of time. So when placement actually happens, it's just a couple of sheets of paper. There's really not much. There's something called a blue form, because it's blue, that we get that um, gives us rights um, as foster parents to make some decisions for our foster children. And there's a couple of other forms with our agency and with um, the department that we have to sign that says we are taking placement of this child. But other than that, there isn't a whole lot of paperwork that has to be done immediately. But then you do have some responsibilities within that first 24 hours as a foster parent. So even though they've already been seen and checked out at the hospital initially, you do have to have a pediatrician appointment booked within those first 24 hours. They don't have to be seen within those first 24 hours, but you have to at least have an appointment um, booked with your pediatrician so the child can go in and that's when they will pull up their records. Hopefully the child has seen a pediatrician in the past and their records are available and um, then you will start to gain some more medical information about them and their health. So that has to be done right away. And then um, there will be other things that you want to get the ball rolling on right away that will be helpful to you. For example, in Rhode Island, children under the age of five, and I think this is federal, so it should be um, all throughout the United States, is they are eligible for WIC. So WIC is a supplemental food program. It is not food stamps, but it's supplemental for children under the age of five. So that means babies, they will help you with formula and um, baby food. And then older children, they will help supply things like milk, bread, eggs, cheese, and you know, just some staple food products that these children are eligible for. And um, your income does not play a factor in whether they can get this or not. And so that does really go a long way with helping your food budget. Along with that blue form or whatever form of paperwork your state provides you with that shows that you are now in care of this child, you should also be getting their medical cards. Sometimes the parents actually have them and they will give them to the social worker so that you have a physical um, medical card. But even if that doesn't happen, all of the children in foster care are eligible for state insurance, state health insurance. So within a matter of days, your foster child um, should be getting a whatever your state uh, health insurance is. So in Rhode Island, we have Neighborhood Health Plan and they have Medicaid as well. And so those two forms of um, insurance the children automatically qualify for. So you can feel free to book medical appointments as necessary and they will be covered. You don't have to be worried that that's gonna come out of your pocket. So the initial form that says they're in your care and their medical forms are really the two big pieces of paperwork that you wanna make sure you have. And then, um, like I said, gain as much information as you can the night they are placed or the day that they are placed and then don't feel um, like you're bugging a social worker if you're calling the very next day to try to get more information. I will tell you that the squeaky wheel gets the oil when it comes to foster care. Uh, as we've fostered for years and years, uh, we have gained a lot of um, experience and know-how, so we don't um, kind of bug our social worker with questions that you know we don't um, want to bug them with that we can find out somewhere else. But when it comes to these basic things, you don't want to sit around and say, think to yourself, 
they'll eventually get back to you because their job by nature is putting out fires. They are doing the most important thing first. And so if you're sitting back and you realize you don't have a medical card, you don't have a form that says you can bring this child to a doctor's appointment or register them for school or any of those they're probably not, um, you're probably not on the top of their list to get that done. So you have to be a squeaky wheel and give them a call and let them know, hey, I never got this and um, I need your help with that. So those first 24 hours, like I said, your goal is to be that safe place for your foster child. And that's all you have to think about is how do I get to know this child so that I can make the situation as least traumatizing as possible. And then additionally, you reach out to all the resources that you have to get what you need for them. Um, we've talked about in other videos, reaching out to your agency, to nonprofits, um, churches. They Many of these places have uh, donation closets to get all of the physical needs that you might need. And then make sure you are that squeaky wheel with your agency or with your social worker to get the other things that you need. You have to be the advocate for yourself and for your foster child. So, like I said, in those first 24 hours, just keep an open mind, go with the flow, um, and don't be scared off by um, big behaviors, big feelings, all of those kinds of things. Remember, even as hard as it might be for you as a foster parent to be in this new situation, as scary it is for you, you're the adult and you can only imagine what is going on in that little mind and that little heart. So I can guarantee you, you can help them. You can be that soft landing place for them and you're just what that child needs. So I hope that these tips helped you and gave you a little bit of a picture of what those first 24 hours might hold for you. And so you guys can go out there and love God and love others.